Good afternoon, everybody. I call to order this hearing of the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration, Citizenship, and Border Safety. Uh, this hearing will come to order, and I do thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is a, a hearing uh, to explore some uh, critical and timely issues, and I want to thank uh, start by thanking our ranking member, Senator Cornyn, and his staff for once again working so collaboratively with me and my team in putting this hearing together. Uh, that's not always a given around here. Uh, so I want to make sure, Senator Cornyn, you know how much I pre appreciate your partnership both on this subcommittee and in our other work together. Now, we're here today to examine the challenges that many immigrants face in seeking lawful permanent resident status. For more than 200 years, people have come to the United States from around the world to seek refuge, pursue opportunity, and live the American dream. And for generations, the dreams and hard work of immigrants have fueled our economy, sparked groundbreaking scientific discoveries, enhanced our national security, and strengthened our communities. That's why Congress has routinely created pathways for people around the world to live and work in this country and to bring their families along with them. But the immigration system that Congress designed to achieve those critical goals has failed to keep up with our needs in the 21st century. In this hearing, we'll hear testimony on barriers to legal migration that routinely separate families across international borders for years. Visa caps that keep employers from expanding their businesses and hold back the U.S. economy. And arbitrary cutoffs for legal status that force children of visa holders to leave the only country they've ever known when they age out of their parents' visas. The gap between our country's needs and the realities of our broken immigration system should come as no surprise. After all, Congress hasn't passed a significant update to our immigration policy in more than three decades. Think about that. We're still relying on an immigration framework that was last overhauled before the launch of the World Wide Web. And this has had devastating consequences for hardworking families and for the economy. Currently, there's a backlog of 1.4 million people who are eligible for employment-based visas. Employment-based visas allow participating immigrants to bring extraordinary skills to our workforce, start new businesses, create new jobs in rural areas, and to help address worker shortages in industries like healthcare. But only 140,000 of these individuals can obtain visas every year. And because the spouses and children who accompany them count against the total, far fewer than 70,000 visas actually go to eligible workers. Hundreds of thousands of others are left in limbo, restricted by a temporary visa, or turned away from their dreams, and they're kept from realizing their potential. Our immigration laws also cause years of delay for millions of family members who are otherwise eligible to join their relatives in the United States. The annual cap on family-based visas is far lower than global demand, with about 7.7 .7 million people stuck in our backlog. That means millions of parents and children, sisters and brothers, and married couples face years or even decades of separation. Wait times are further exacerbated by strict limits on how many visas can go to an individual country. And the term wait time, for many, is actually a cruel misnomer. For applicants from some countries, the wait time is literally longer than any human's life expectancy. It's past time to update our immigration laws to reflect the current needs of our nation. I thank my colleagues who are leading common sense bills to address these unnecessary barriers to legal migration. For instance, Senator Durbin, chair of the Judiciary Committee, has the Relief Act, which would increase the availability of visas to reunite families. Senator Menendez's U.S. Citizenship Act would eliminate per-country caps, increase the number of green cards through the Diversity Visa Program, 
and recapture millions of previously unused visas to reduce green card backlogs. Representative Lofgren's Like Act would create a pathway for immigrant entrepreneurs to strengthen our economy. And I worked across the aisle with Senator Paul to introduce the America's Children Act, which would create green card opportunities for children who grew up in the United States but are now aging out of their parents' temporary visas. The stakes of this work could not be higher. Professor Stephen Legomsky is joining us today to testify about how our outdated immigration laws are harming our communities and our economy. Mr. Melmed will focus on barriers to skills-based migration. And Atulia Rajakumar, a documented dreamer and aspiring journalist, is here to share the story of her family's struggle through years of immigration limbo, which contributed to her brother's tragic death. Atulia, I, um, my heart goes out to you and your family, and I appreciate you being here and sharing your story. Now, I'm outraged by this broken system that you, your brother, and thousands of documented dreamers have had to face. We organize this hearing today because we cannot allow the inaction of Congress to continue to cause this suffering. The United States was founded as a nation of immigrants, and it's time to honor that spirit once again. I know I'm here to put in the work. I'm ready to have constructive, productive conversations with our Republican colleagues, these issues need to be more than just by people are partisan in spirit. We must act. We must fix this outdated system. And I know we can do it if we work together. And now I want to recognize Ranking Member Cornyn for his opening remarks before we get to our uh, witnesses and the balance of today's hearing. Senator Cornyn. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing on barriers to legal immigration. We've long known the vital contribution immigrant workers make to our economic growth and to our national fabric. Last year in this subcommittee, we heard testimony that foreign-born workers often bring special skill sets to the United States and that U.S. economic growth over the last three decades would have been significantly lower in their absence. That's certainly the case in my home state of Texas, where we've benefited from the contributions of foreign-born workers in virtually every industry. Just as one example, it's been estimated that 30% of practicing physicians in the Dallas-Fort Worth area are foreign-born, 30%. Unfortunately, our current immigration system fails to harness the full economic potential of immigrant workers. The Congressional Research Service recently estimated that without significant change, The employment-based green card backlog could exceed 2 million by the year 2030. Indian nationals have been hit especially hard because our system's per country caps do not allow them to receive more than 7% of the available employment-based visas in any given year. To make matters worse, due to processing inefficiencies attributable in part to USCIS's paper-based system, and to the closures of many of our consulates. We failed to issue as many as 92,000 employment-based visas in the height of the pandemic. Senator Tillis has recently proposed the Preserving Employment Visas Act, which would recapture these unused visas and allow us to use them to reduce the employment-based green card backlog. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of that legislation along with another member of this subcommittee, Senator Coons. I'd also like to highlight my work with the chairman of the full committee, Senator Durbin, on the Healthcare Workforce Resilience Act, which would recapture as many as 40,000 unused employment-based green cards, which would be used, issued to doctors and nurses. Many foreign physicians and nurses work on H-1B visas while waiting for a green card, and our legislation would help reduce that backlog. And finally, I'm a proud co-sponsor of legislation last Congress that would have eliminated the per-country caps for employment-based immigrants, ensuring that countries like India do not face disproportionately long backlogs. 
I highlight these bills to demonstrate the strong appetite for immigration reform on this side of the aisle. Unfortunately, the opportunity to act on these and other productive pieces of legislation has been completely derailed because of the current humanitarian crisis at our southern border. Since President Biden took office, we've seen historically high levels of illegal border crossings along our southwest border. Last month alone, Customs and Border Protection recorded 164,000 plus encounters along the southwest border, the highest total in more than 20 years. And that's just for last month. We know that as the weather warms up in the springtime, those numbers will continue to grow and grow. In spite of this, the administration doesn't seem to really care or take the problem of this crisis at the border seriously. Rather than deter would-be migrants with weak asylum claims from taking the dangerous journey to the southwest border, the administration has rolled out the welcome mat and created new incentives to illegally immigrate to the United States. For example, the Department of Homeland Security has adopted a policy of paroling migrants into the United States without first issuing them a notice to appear before an immigration judge, the document that formally commences immigration court proceedings. Unsurprisingly, a large percentage of these migrants don't show up and don't turn themselves in to the nearest ICE office when they reach their final destination in the United States. The Biden administration has also re-implemented and updated its Central American Miners Program and now allows migrants with asylum claims that were filed on or before May 15, 2021 to petition to have their children brought to the United States. And two months ago, Senate Democrats asked Secretary of Homeland Security Mayorkas and Secretary of State Blinken to redesignate El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala for temporary protected status. This would give migrants with non-existent asylum claims another avenue for lawful status in the United States, and one that is unlikely to be truly temporary. Senator Sinema, Democrat from Arizona, another border state, and I have introduced narrow, targeted, bipartisan legislation that would help us resolve the crisis on the southwest border. It would treat migrants fairly and deter those with weak asylum claims from attempting to cross in the first place. I'm pleased that Senator Tillis and Senator Hassan have joined us as bipartisan co-sponsors. Democratic leadership could demonstrate that they were serious about taking up our Bipartisan Border Solutions Act as a first step to get the crisis on our southwest border under some semblance of control. There was a brief glimmer of hope last year when Senator Durbin, the chairman of the full Judiciary Committee, convened a working group to explore bipartisan immigration reform options. But rather than engage in a constructive process, it actually produced solutions Senator Durbin prematurely declared those talks a failure, claiming that Republicans made unreasonable demands. He advocated for a quixotic, partisan, go-it-alone approach that would create a pathway to citizenship for six to eight million illegal immigrants. This, of course, came without any accompanying measures to increase border security or interior enforcement to ensure that the undocumented population doesn't accrue yet again. Thankfully, the Senate parliamentarian ruled against this effort to go it alone and use the reconciliation process. But unfortunately, in taking this partisan tack, our Democratic colleagues have poisoned the well when it comes to bipartisan immigration reform. It will be difficult to rebuild the trust with one another in order to come up with bipartisan solutions. Having said that, I am willing to work with anyone Republican or Democrat to secure our borders and make it easier for legal immigrants to contribute to the American economy. But our best chance of updating our immigration laws lies in putting in the hard work necessary to craft consensus bipartisan legislation that make more targeted choices. As long as our colleagues across the aisle insist on a purely partisan measure uh, with massive scope, the Senate will do what we have done 
for almost the entire time I've been here in the Senate, which has never fail to fail. I'm looking forward to the testimony today about the changes that uh, would be suggested here to harness the full economic potential of our immigration system. And I know that while we don't agree on every proposal today, Mr. Chairman, I hope we can continue to find common ground where we can. Mr. Chairman, may I uh, say a word about the, uh, Mr. Melman, my, the third witness? Um, Lyndon Melmed is the uh, third witness here today and a partner in the Barry Appleman Leiden law firm here in D.C. Before joining that firm, Lyndon served as chief counsel of the U.S. Uh, Customs and Immigration Service, the agency's highest ranking legal position. As chief counsel of USCIS, Lyndon managed a legal team of about 130 lawyers and was a key advisor to senior leadership within USCIS, DHS, and the White House and other federal agencies on all aspects of immigration law. Before, he, before his um, role in USCIS, Lyndon served as my immigration counsel when I was chairman of this subcommittee, and I value his counsel and advice on all matters pertaining to the subject matter of today's hearing. So it's good to have you back again with us here, Lennon, in the uh, Judiciary Committee, and I'm sure the entire subcommittee will benefit from your excellent counsel as I have in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Before uh, introducing the other two witnesses, and uh, want to uh, recognize uh, Chairman Durbin for some remarks, but even before that, uh, Senator Durbin, a uh, couple of comments on uh, Senator uh, Cornyn's remarks. I just want to make sure that we're not conflating two different dynamics here. Someone coming to the United States seeking refuge or asylum uh, is very different than the case, and we're going to be hearing uh, a perfect example of it today, of a young person who is here, who has been here lawfully, uh, as, as a child of an immigrant who has a lawful employment-based visa, and stuck waiting, stuck in a backlog so long that they age out of those protections with uh, no means of uh, changing status. So I just want to make sure we're, we don't conflate two very different scenarios. And as it pertains to the asylum system, it's important to recognize the asylum system is indeed a legal migration pathway. People who come to our border fleeing persecution uh, and seeking protection have a legal right to ask for asylum. may not be guaranteed, but they have a right to ask for it. And those who are able to establish a valid claim are allowed to stay here permanently and seek a green card after a year. Uh, there is a, a notion that uh, immigrants are misusing the asylum system by filing false claims. Uh, the fact is false claims made by asylum applica applicants are extremely uncommon. And in fact, 99% of all asylum seekers do appear for their hearing. And finally, expanding and increasing legal immigration avenues for family reunification, employment opportunities, and humanitarian relief would help disincentivize unauthorized immigration. So uh, I think it just continues to underscore the complexities of our immigration system and its, our need for modernization. With that, Senator Durbin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Is there anyone in America who's not following what's going on in Ukraine? Turn on the television every single day for another heartbreaking scene, and you wonder about those poor people, those families at the train station where the mother holding the baby is kissing her husband goodbye and wonders if she'll ever see him again. She takes that train most times to Poland. And an interesting thing has happened. Poland now has received about one and a half million refugees from Ukraine. We estimate that three million Ukrainians have left their country, three million refugees. The Polish ambassador spoke to us last week at a meeting. And he said, I hope you've noticed something. We don't have any refugee camps in Poland. The people who get off that train are greeted by Polish families who bring them into their homes. They welcome these refugees. They're not the only country in Europe that does that. 
There are only five million people living in Ireland. They've agreed to accept 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. And you look at the United States of America and you wonder, how would we have reacted to this situation? Three million displaced people in Ukraine out of a 40 million population. What is a comparable number in the United States? Well, it's the state of Texas. 29 million people, if they were in a matter of three weeks displaced from their home and sent out around the nation, around the region, trying to find a place to call home. Would America respond? Would we open our doors to those refugees? And I just suspect it's possible that many of the European countries that are accepting Ukrainians are accepting people who by and large look like them, by and large have their same types of religion and culture and background. And it's a fact of life that when it comes to choosing refugees who are acceptable, we are much more caring when they look like our own. And when they don't, we're not as welcoming. I hope that the United States will show not just by appropriated funds, but by appropriated values that we share the feeling of the people of Poland and others, not just for these refugees, but other refugees. Now, there are some among us who just say flat out, make no mistake, I don't want a single one coming into this country. I don't want another immigrant, not one. And if you're going to come up with ideas on how to bring more immigrants in this country, count me out. We have colleagues just like that. I know. I've spoken to them. I've listened to them. I've watched them over the years colleagues who never vote for an immigration bill, would not even consider it. And I just don't understand that. We are a nation of immigrants. My mother was an immigrant. I'm proud of that fact. Her naturalization certificate sits behind my desk because it defines who I am and where I come from. We haven't updated this legal immigration system in America in now 32 years. 32 years. In 2013, we tried to change it. I worked with a group of eight led by John McCain and Schumer and Menendez and Bennett and Graham, and I'm missing some here along the way, uh, Senator Flake. We passed a bipartisan comprehensive immigration bill. Some Republicans wouldn't even vote for that, even though it contained more money for border security than we had ever appropriated. The bill passed the Senate 68 to 32. It provided a path to citizenship for millions of immigrants with deep roots in this country. I thought it was the answer. The Republicans wouldn't consider it in the House, wouldn't even take it up. It would have established new protections for American workers, would have cleared the green card backlog, which is one of the reasons we're here today, and it was substantially increased future legal immigration. As I said, it wasn't taken up in the House, and then came the Trump administration. We saw unprecedented attacks on legal immigrants, the Muslim ban, the lowest refugee admissions targets for the United States of America in decades. Do you know what inspired us to create refugee admission targets in the United States? Our reflection on what we did during World War II, turning away the SS St. Louis with hundreds of passengers, Jewish people, trying to escape the Holocaust in Europe. We turned them away. Many of them went back to Europe to die in the Holocaust. And after that experience, we said as a nation, that isn't what America is going to be in the future. Both parties are going to stand up and speak up for refugees and admissions into this country. And we did it consistently until the last president. Last year, I convened a bipartisan immigration negotiation that dragged on for months. Senator Cornyn was speaking to it when I entered the room, so I didn't hear all he said, John, so I won't dwell on it. I was disappointed because there were just people who were sitting at that table who wanted not one more immigrant. Uh, maybe it's partisan on my part, maybe it is, that I believe we're a nation of immigrants and we would be stronger if we had them. One of the most significant challenges that the chairman of the subcommittee just addressed, that's the lack of green cards. The numbers are stunning. Four million future Americans, four million, are stuck in the family green card backlog overseas. Many of them are family members who want to be reunited with their families. I thought we were for family values, but we changed that family migration into something called chain migration, and many of it, many people among 
the Senate uh, membership look on a negative lay, way. So with 4 million family members waiting to be reunited with their families overseas, how many family green cards do we issue each year? 226,000. Do the math. And more than 875,000 immigrants are stuck in the employment green card backlog in the United States. 875,000. We issue 140,000 employment green cards per year. One of the most heartbreaking consequences of the green card backlog is its impact on innocent children. And I know we're going to hear about that today. They've grown up in America. They believe this is their home. They want to be part of its future. They're college students. They're bright and ready to go. But current law strips them of their legal status when they reach the age of 21. As a result, they are, quote, aging out at 21. Athulia Rajkumar, and forgive me if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, one of our witnesses is just such a person. Remarkable persistence despite tremendous obstacles. We'd be a better nation if you were a citizen here, and I hope we can make that happen. That's why I'm proud to sponsor Chairman Padilla's bipartisan bill, America's Children Act, which would provide a path to citizenship to you. And I also commend my House colleagues for including a path to citizenship for so-called documented dreamers. I introduced the DREAM Act 21 years ago in this room. Before that, if you ask people who are the dreamers, they'd say they're a British rock group, aren't they? No, there are a lot of young people who for over two decades have been looking for a chance. I've also introduced the Relief Act, which is based on the bipartisan 2013 Comprehensive Immigration Bill. It will lift the arbitrary country caps that limit the number of green cards that can go to immigrants for any single country in a given year. We need to help everyone stuck in the green card backlog, which is why this act would clear the backlog in five years, not 20, five years. Keep American families together. Also working closely with the House Judiciary Committee on the legal immigration reforms and Build Back Better, I hope the Senate will pass some measure like that this year. And though we have our disagreements, I want to thank Senator Cornyn for partnering with me to introduce the Bipartisan Health Care Workforce Resiliency Act. John, I don't know if you checked the co-sponsorship lately. We're doing pretty good. I think we got a chance to pass that. Addresses the plight of immigrant doctors and nurses stuck in the green card backlog. Strengthening our immigration system will make us a better country. Opening our doors to refugees will remind us of the goodness of the American people. Let's get the job done. Thank you, Chairman Padilla. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Uh, now I want to uh, lay out the mechanics for the rest of today's hearing. Uh, after I introduce and swear in the uh, witnesses, they'll each have five minutes to make their opening remarks. We'll then begin our first round of questions, and each senator will have five minutes. I ask senators to please try to remain within your allotted time. Uh, and uh, now our witnesses. Let's start with Professor Legomsky. Professor Stephen Legomsky is the John S. Lehman University Professor Emeritus at the Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. Professor Legomsky took a leave of absence from 2011 to 2013 to serve as Chief Counsel of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the Immigration Services Agency in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. After retiring in July 2015, he returned to Washington to serve as Senior Counselor to Secure Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson. He has served as a member of President Biden's transition team and as a consultant to the transition teams of Presidents Clinton and Obama. The first President Bush's Commissioner of Immigration, the UN High Commissioner for, for Refugees in Geneva, and several foreign governments on immigration and refugee policies. He has testified before Congress many times while in the private sector, and his book, Immigration and Refugee Law and Policy has been the required text at 193 law schools. Today, we also welcome Atulia Rajakumar. Ms. Rajakumar is a 23-year-old 23 23 recent graduate of the University of Texas at Austin from the Moody College of Communication. Originally from India, she came to the United States when she was four years old as a dependent of her mother's visa. Ms. Rajakumar grew up in Seattle, Washington, and now resides in Dallas, Texas. She has completed her entire education from first grade to her bachelor's degree in the United States. Uh, and Senator Corn has already introduced Mr. Melmet. So 
With that, I would ask each of the witnesses to please rise and be sworn in. Do you affirm that the testimony you are about to give to the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect. Each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. And with that, uh, Professor Lugomsky, let's uh, go ahead and proceed with your opening statement. Thank you for the privilege of testifying before you today. Um, it's now been more than 30 years, as several of you have now said, uh, since Congress last meaningfully uh, updated the numerical limits on legal immigration. And as you know, massive backlogs uh, have now accumulated. Those backlogs have needlessly diminished so many of the benefits that immigrants bring us. My view, for all the reasons contained in my written statement, is that the US could and should significantly increase the number of immigrants whom we, admit, whom we admit each year. But whether or not one shares that view, I think there are four things that Congress can do now that would not increase total immigration, but would put a serious dent in the backlog and shorten the long waiting periods faced by qualified immigrants. These four measures don't change any of the individual criteria for admission as a lawful permanent resident, an LPR, um, they would, however, simply allow those immigrants who eventually will be admitted anyway to be admitted sooner rather than later. So they would affect the timing of a given person's admission, but not the overall long-term numbers. As you know, the statute contains formulas for computing the annual worldwide caps on family-sponsored and employment-based immigrants. Uh, my first set of proposals calls for three changes to those formulas increasing the base numbers of 480,000 and 140,000, respectively, recapturing all the visas that Congress has authorized but that have gone unused because of bureaucratic delays since the start of the current system in 1992, and in the family-sponsored program, repealing the present deduction for uh, the previous year's admission of immediate relatives. Uh, second, one of the family-sponsored subcategories consists of the so-called two A's, these are the spouses and the unmarried under age 21 children of LPRs. <clears throat> At the moment, except for the across the board administrative processing delays, there's, not, there's actually no waiting period for two A's. But it hasn't always been that way and there's no guarantee it won't become that way again. At times, two A's have had to wait as much as five and a half years to join their nuclear families in the US, even longer if they're from Mexico. This is an especially serious problem because the petitions are usually filed uh, soon after the sponsoring LPRs marry or have children overseas. Um, so to be clear, for the most part, the people we're talking about here are newlyweds being separated for the first several years of their marriage um, and parents being separated from their newborn babies for the first several years of the child's life. My second proposal, therefore, is to reclassify the two A's as immediate relatives, thus freeing them from the numerical limits that have given rise to these long delays. The humanitarian concerns are obvious, and my written statement contains several additional practical reasons to address these separations. Third, the current law also limits the number of qualified immigrants who may be admitted from any one country in a single year, as has been noted. The current per country caps have produced extreme results, including very long waiting periods for Mexican and Filipino immigrants in the family category and for Chinese and Indian immigrants uh, in the employment category. My third proposal doesn't require repealing these per country caps, although I personally would be in favor of doing so, uh, but it does call for raising them. My fourth proposal concerns lawfully admitted temporary workers, mainly the H-1Bs, whose petitions for employment-based LPR status have been approved, uh, but who have been waitlisted for actual adjustment of status. Uh, this proposal would allow them to file their adjustment applications a certain amount of time in advance to give USCIS a head start on the processing. And the fifth and final proposal, unlike the first four, uh, would extend eligibility to some individuals uh, who are currently blocked. 
It would repeal the various provisions that bar people from the U.S. for three years or 10 years or in some cases for life because of past, not current, but past unlawful presence. My own view is that the harshness of these bars is inherently disproportionate uh, to the offenses that they mean to punish. But the most severe consequences of these provisions fall on those immigrants who have been unlawfully present at one time or another, but who now satisfy all of Congress's substantive eligibility requirements for immigrating to the United States. By that I mean they fall within one of the categories established by Congress, family, employment, et cetera. They don't fall within any of the inadmissibility grounds uh, uh, created by Congress, and they have waited their turn in line to the point where their priority dates are now current. For them, these bars create a procedural catch-22. As my written statement explains, and as I'll be happy to elaborate uh, further if there is interest, uh, they meet all these substantive requirements, but there's simply no place they can go to actually file their applications. For various reasons, they can't apply overseas, and for various other reasons, they can't apply here in the United States as well. Again, I will be happy to elaborate. Uh, thank you all once more. Thank you, Professor Rogomsky. Now I'll turn to Ms. Raja Kumar for your testimony. Chairman Padilla, Ranking Member Cornyn, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to share my story. My name is Athelia Rajkumar. I'm a recent graduate of the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also a member of Improve the Dream, a youth-led organization that supports and advocates for over 200,000 young immigrants who grow up in the United States with a documented status but face self-deportation after aging out of the immigration system. I am a documented dreamer. I was born in India, and when I was four and my brother was six, my mother left an abusive marriage in search of a better life for us. After graduating from San Jose State University, she secured a full-time job and was able to acquire a work visa. Eventually, in 2012, she was able to apply for her green card with me and my brother as her dependents. After nearly a decade in the green card backlog, I aged out in January of 2020 when I turned 21. My single mother worked hard to support me and my brother on her own. Things were hard, but still, I remember making happy memories while building our new life, like eating red, white, and blue popsicles on the 4th of July, driving through neighborhoods to look at Christmas lights, and watching my first baseball game at the National Stadium just a few miles from here. These experiences, uniquely American, are not only unforgettable, but a part of who I am today. I learned very young that every aspect of my life would be controlled by my status. I could not participate in my high school's AP French exchange program, even though I was president of the French club because I could not leave the country and guarantee a return. When I applied to colleges, I was considered an international student, even though I completed first to 12th grade in America. I had to answer questions like, what can you contribute to our institution as a resident from your country? I grew up in Seattle. Starbucks was founded there. I didn't know how much more American I could get. I also could not qualify for any federal or university financial aid. Regardless, I worked hard earn good grades to get direct admission into my dream program at Moody College of Communications Journalism School to pursue my long-term goal of becoming a journalist so I could use my voice to bring awareness to important issues. My brother and I were forced to raise ourselves because my mother was always working, not only to provide for us, but also to retain our visa status. Due to this uncertainty and anxiety, we both faced severe mental health issues, my older brother to a worse extent. He should have been pulled out of school, given proper medication at counseling, and at times I felt he should have been institutionalized. However, as age four dependents, we legally needed to be enrolled as full-time students to remain in this country. And though my mother wanted to quit her job and stay home with him, risking her job meant risking our entire life here. After college, he took the LSAT, in which he scored in the 98th percentile and got into some of the best law schools in the country. We thought, if we cannot fight the immigration system, maybe we can work to help change it. His goal was to become an immigration lawyer and speak out for this group of children that America cannot see or refuses to recognize. However, the day before his orientation at the University of Washington, he took his own life. Our entire family was torn apart and our worlds were turned upside down. I flew home and went from writing a school paper to his obituary in less than 24 hours. And the most cruel part of this tragic situation was that we were not even given the proper time to mourn. Within one week, I was back in college, and by the end of the month, my mother had to be back at work. Once again, our visa status controlled our lives, even when one of us was dead. I can only describe this life as simply existing, 
not living, but surviving. I'm 23 years old. I should be excited about my goals, but I'm scared because I know they'll be taken away from me by something I cannot control. I got a full-time offer from, from a major news corporation in Houston, a top 10 market, but the same company who saw my potential withdrew their offer the second they heard about my visa status. But worst of all, being considered an alien, an outsider, in the only place you know to call home is a different kind of pain. Without a change, in eight months, I will be forced to leave not only my home of 20 years, but also my mom, who is my only family left. Over 5,000 documented dreamers face this every year. Erin, a nursing graduate, was forced to self-deport last summer in the midst of a pandemic. Rutha, a data analyst student, was forced to self-deport two months ago. Summer will be forced to self-deport in four months, even though her family has legally resided here since she was a baby. Members of Improve the Dream hope that one day, everyone who grows up in America can become an American citizen and fully contribute to our country. Members of this subcommittee can make this a reality by passing America's Children Act, a bipartisan bill that would permanently end aging out and ensure that children like me, who are raised and educated with a documented status, receive a clear opportunity to apply for permanent residency. This bill would create a reality that most Americans likely assume already exists. The subcommittee should also address root causes that lead to aging out, including the green card backlog and the flaws in our system that allow for lawful long-term residents without any clear path to citizenship. Though the immigration system has constantly tested my faith, I am thankful my mom brought me here. We are Americans and all we hope is to be recognized as that, to finally give meaning to the lives that we have lived here so far. I hope you can improve the dream for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Raja Kumar. It takes uh, courage to share your story and it's beyond moving. I know your mother's with us today and I want to thank her for her courage as well. Mr. Melman. Thank you, Chairman Padilla, Ranking Member Cornyn. Good to see you. Appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, as the Chairman mentioned, my testimony is gonna focus on barriers to skilled immigration if you ask any company in any industry today where Congress should place its efforts on addressing that problem, you will encounter something rare in the immigration debate, consensus. Almost all companies agree that the lengthy green card backlog and related per country limits make it difficult to attract and retain high-skilled immigrants. When I joined the government in 2002, not a single employment-based immigrant, irrespective of nationality, had to wait for a green card number. Two decades later, it is estimated there could be as many as 1.4 million employment-based immigrants in the backlog, and nationals of India and China face decades-long wait times. Compounding the outdated numerical limits, hundreds of thousands of green card numbers have been wasted because the agency was an unable to use them within the fiscal year. Last year, approximately 80,000 numbers, although I heard earlier maybe more than 100,000 numbers, went unused. Halfway through the current fiscal year, the data suggests the agencies will fall short again, perhaps by an even bigger amount. I'd like to pause on this point. Agency processing capacity now has a larger impact on immigration levels and flows than any legislation passed by Congress in the past few decades. The agencies have legal authority to remediate prior shortfalls. There's legislation that I know many members here have introduced and sponsored, and I encourage Congress to address that issue. Lengthy green card wait times have near-term and long-term consequences for U.S. competitiveness. Knowing that they will have to wait decades for a green card in the U.S., highly skilled foreign nationals are increasingly taking their talents to other countries, including Canada. Toronto now leads the 30 top tech markets for job growth in the U.S. and Canada, and Vancouver ranks third. A key component of Canada's job growth is its willingness to grant permanent residence to high-skilled immigrants without delay. 56% of new immigrants to Canada will enter through economic channels. In contrast, only 6% of legal immigrants to the U.S. enter through economic channels. There is, however, one essential way that the U.S. employment-based system is superior. Our employer sponsorship model is very efficient at aligning immigrant skills with the labor market, which reduces the likelihood that the country will admit highly skilled workers that end up underemployed. As you heard earlier, the green card backlogs place employees and their families in very difficult and heart-rendering situations. Many high-skilled immigrants from India, including those who graduate from U.S. universities and work in critical STEM fields, will face the choice of leaving the U.S. or remaining on a temporary work visa for their entire life. 
Those outcomes are inconsistent with our country's values, but they also undermine our economic interests. The US is losing key employees and limiting the career progress of those that remain in the system at a time when there is already a shortfall and record unemployment, particularly in computer-related occupations. Furthermore, the children of green card applicants can age out, as you heard earlier. There is little that I can add to Ms. Raja Kumar's powerful testimony other than to validate that the legal options for documented dreamers are few and far between. Finally, I wish to call attention to how the green card backlog relates to processing delays at the agencies. High-skilled workers in a backlog must repeatedly extend their status and work and travel documentation, often for years on end. The family of a high-skilled immigrant will file multiple applications while waiting in that backlog. And today, the government often takes over a year to process a simple employment authorization document. Not only does that processing time force business disruption on thousands of companies and workers, but those ap extra applications get added to a case processing backlog that is really difficult to get your head around. In 2013, the agency had 3 million pending applications. Today, that backlog exceeds 9.5 million and is expected to grow. I raise this because I'm often asked how the agency can address processing delays, and it is clear to me the government can't keep doing the same thing as they did in the past and simply hire its way out of the problem. Congress and the agency should focus on how immigrants move through the system and eliminate unnecessary steps in bureaucracy. In closing, I want to thank the committee for calling attention to this important issue. I outlined several policy options for, for Congress and the agencies to consider, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Rava. Thank you to all three of you for your testimony. Uh, and now uh, questions from the committee. Uh, a major failure of the U.S. immigration system is the failure to consider the fate of the children of temporary visa holders. While their parents have applied for green cards, uh, applications remain stuck in years-long backlogs. Uh, there are currently over 250,000 children of long-term temporary visa holders who are at risk of aging out from the protection of their parents' status. These are individuals who, like Ms. Raja Kumar, have grown up in the United States, have contributed greatly to their communities, and who are unmistakably American. For these documented dreamers, as they're called, there are almost no pathways to remain in the country after aging out of their parents' visas. So when they turn 21, they face the impossible decision of leaving their families to return to a country that is often completely foreign to them, or living undocumented in the shadows. I introduced the Bipartisan America's Children Act, which would create green card opportunities for these children and fix this often overlooked inequity in our immigration system. Ms. Raja Kumar, again, thank you for sharing your story with us. And if I may, uh, can you explain how the enactment of the bill, I know you're familiar with it, how it would impact your life? and what having a pathway to citizenship would mean to you. First and foremost, what comes to my brain is that my mom and I would not be immediately separated. But second, it would allow me to pursue my desired career path, gain experience, and while these are tangible things I can point out, the biggest thing that it would do is allow me to build my life here permanently and contribute to the place that I've called home for 20 years without fear that it would be taken away from me. Thank you. Uh, second question is for Mr. Melman. Do you think it makes sense for our immigration system to allow children to be brought here on their parents' visa, raised and educated here, oftentimes for decades, but not have a clear opportunity to become an American citizen because their parents' green card petition is stuck in the backlog? So make sure your microphone is on. Chairman, it doesn't make sense. And if I could add additional points uh, to that question is that um, the backlog that they are experiencing was not contemplated by Congress previously. Um, backlogs are not new to the immigration system. You can, you can say, in fact, that the 70 years ago there were backlogs in the immigration system. And Congress has on multiple times enacted relief 
for children who are aging out. But this particular group that Ms. Rajakumar is part of um, was not considered because those backlogs didn't exist at the time that Congress previously considered this issue. Um, the second very sympathetic factor about this, this situation that they encounter themselves in as part of my testimony is these backlogs didn't exist as recently as 2013. So at the time that the parents entered the country on the temporary work visas, it, it wasn't like they could have known, none of us really necessarily foresaw the explosion in those backlogs over the, of the ensuing decade. Um, as I did mention, Congress has wrestled with this issue before. Uh, there's been various policy solutions, including uh, in some situations freezing their age and other times using a formula to back out agency processing times to afford relief. So there are a few options for Congress to consider to provide relief and they can look at prior legislation perhaps as a roadmap. Uh, share your, your observation, not just on this particular dynamic, but more broadly. And what's clear from today's testimony is that our immigration laws are outdated and no longer serve the purpose for which they were created. Now, reforming our family, employment, and diversity visa systems would be in the best interest of our economy and our communities. Professor Legomsky, in your testimony, you highlighted several ideas to help reform the system and uh, reduce the harmful backlog. I'd like to ask specifically about the idea of reclassifying spouses and unmarried children of legal permanent residents who are applying for family-based green cards. Right now, those individuals are subject to the arbitrary numerical limits, but your suggestion would be to classify them as immediate relatives, a category of relatives that is not subject to the numerical caps. So, Professor, can you explain why you believe a fix to this category of family-based petitioners would have a significant impact on reducing the backlog? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think my strongest reason for feeling this would be a good fix uh, just focuses on who these people are in reality. As I mentioned during my original remarks, um, these are people who petition for their spouses or their, for their new spouses or their new born babies sometime after becoming an LPR. I should explain that if you are admitted as an LPR, the current law does allow you to bring with you your accompanying uh, spouse and underage 21 unmarried children. The problem is that if you immigrate as an LPR and then you get married to someone who is not a citizen, or then you get married to someone uh, and have a baby overseas, uh, those children fall and spouse fall into the 2A category rather than the accompanying category. And although there currently is no wage, as I mentioned, there were very long waits before. The reason I focus on who these people are is that because the petitions are filed typically soon after the event, we are talking about separating newlywed couples and separating parents from their newborn babies for the first several years of their lives. And my guess is that people of all political stripes would recognize this to be a serious problem, uh, a particularly heartbreaking one. But there are a couple of other practical reasons as well. One is that um, since the family members cannot come here until their visa numbers come up, if the LPR wants to maintain any semblance of a family life, what that person is going to have to do is periodically and frequently travel overseas. Uh, to visit his or her family members, often at great disruption to the person's job, often um, at great expense. And thirdly, and I know this will be a little more controversial, um, it seems to me that when the waits do become this long, you're practically inviting illegal immigration. I want to be clear that I'm not advocating illegal immigration. I'm simply calling attention to the reality that human nature will have to be remade before newlywed spouses willingly separate for years at a time at the beginning of their marriage. Human nature will have to be remade before parents willingly separate from their newborn babies for the first several years of the child's life. My guess is that most of us in, that, in this room would not do so. And so these are compelling, particularly compelling circumstances for the family sponsored two A's. Thank you. Senator Cornyn. Ms. Roger Kumar, it's uh, Nice to meet you. I hate, uh, hate for it to be under these circumstances. I certainly am sympathetic to your conundrum and those others like you have aged out of the H-1B system. Um, and I'd like to work with Senator Padilla uh, on the legislation he's introduced to come up with a solution. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to not only your 
situation, but for the other um, Im immigrants who've come here as children, um, known sometimes as the Dreamers, sometimes as DACA recipients for the Deferred Action on Childhood Arrival Memorandum that President Obama issued 10 years ago, which continues to be caught up in litigation, which is a reason why that sort of executive action is a bad way uh, to do immigration reform. Uh, I voted for a bill that uh, contained other elements to be sure, but which provided a pathway to citizenship for 1.8 million uh, DREAMers or DACA recipients. Unfortunately, it failed in the Senate, which has been the story since I've been in the Senate. Um, we, Congress has never been successful in getting an immigration reform bill to the president's desk for his signature uh, since I've been here. And I think that uh, should be an embarrassment uh, to us all. Mr. Melman, let me ask you uh, two questions. First, is the problem of H-1B dependence aging out a symptom of greater underlying problem with our immigration system in your view? Uh, Ranking Member Cornyn, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, these are, for the most part, immigrants who have already established to the government that they're eligible for a green card. They have, their employers have already gone through a multi-year process to establish that there's no qualified and available U.S. workers. Um, their employers have repeatedly sponsored them for work visas, showing an ongoing need. Um, and their communities and their employers have been invested a huge amount in them. Um, the, the sole reason that they are aging out is because they are caught in that green card backlog. And it falls most heavily on Indian nationals who are limited by the per country 7% uh, limit. Is the America's Children Act consistent with the approach that Congress has used to address these problems in the past, in your view? Um, when Congress, you know, even recently as last week with EB-5, Congress historically has taken, has, well, there's been, excuse me, back, let me back up. There's been consensus to protect children when this has been brought to the attention of Congress. So I'll start with that. But the solutions that Congress has pursued in the past um, have generally focused on either, um, I use the term freezing the, the child's age at a certain date in the green card process. So even though the child will sometimes be in their 20s or 30s, is still for immigration law purposes considered a child. And other times the relief um, utilizes a formula to ensure that um, they just back out the amount of time that a case was pending with the government, which can sometimes, of course, measure years. Um, what they didn't do is necessarily create a different path to a green card. And what I mean by that is uh, the children continued to ride along as derivatives to their parents' green card application, as opposed to going out onto their own application for a green card. So those are just different policy decisions. Uh, both should be considered, but you're correct, in the past it was done as where they stayed as derivatives to their parents. Well, assuming that we can come up with a bipartisan response to uh, this particular problem that Raja, Ms. Raja Kumar's uh, situation exemplifies, um, it would require, of course, the Judiciary Committee as a whole uh, to mark up a bill and then Senator Schumer to bring it to the floor as the uh, Senate is currently constituted. I know Senator Tillis and I previously had requested when it came to the larger group of DACA recipients who've been caught up in litigation for the last 10 years, we've requested that the chairman put a bill in front of the Judiciary Committee so we can vote on it, amend it as appropriate, and if it gets a majority vote, then make it available for floor action. But unfortunately, uh, that, has not, that has not happened. Um, Mr. Remmett, let me ask you about visa overstays. Um, what role does v do visa overstays play in terms of illegal immigration in the United States? Well, I apologize that maybe at one point I could cite the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, it's a significant percentage. Uh, historically, it's been over 40% are visa overstays. I hazard a guess that that number is um, higher over the past few years as a percentage of the undocumented immigration. Um, you know, there's been 
efforts throughout the years to improve entry exit tracking and to have a better sense of who has overstayed their lawful status. Um, I, I think that the tools that are available to the agencies today are different than they were back in 1996, which is really the last time Congress tried to tackle the question of overstays. And it's, it's probably ripe now for a review to look at that question. Thank you. A note before recognizing Senator Durbin, uh, the American Children's, the America's Children Act uh, on a bipartisan basis introduced includes a provision to freeze their age at 21. It would also give work authorization. The main, the main benefit of the American Children's Act would be it creates an opportunity for the children who are raised and educated here to apply for a green card and we should do uh, what we can to uh, help them. So just wanted to add that uh, uh, piece of information as we're talking about the uh, proposed act. Senator Durbin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Uh, Raja Kumar, I assume that is your mother sitting behind you? Yes. Yeah, it is. She's a remarkable person. Definitely. That she would want to protect you and your family and go to these lengths says a great deal about you. Thank you so much. When will she receive a green card? Does she have a date? So actually, shortly after I aged out of the application, my mother did receive her green card, which is why if I was forced to leave in eight months, we would first and foremost be separated. And while she may have the opportunity to come visit me from time to time, our lives would be in completely separate places. Of course. Um, Mr. Melman. Our omnibus bill had more money for processing, which you raise, and I think it's a valid point. But wouldn't you agree that unless we get to the heart of the issue in terms of the number of green cards, that we're going to continue to run into problems even if we are efficiently processing applications? Absolutely, Senator Durbin. At this point in the process for an Indian national, the, the agency processing times are checked with our, our firm before appearing. The overall green proce card process is still measured in years in terms of agency processing, but the issue that their family ran into is tied solely to the sure. lack of green card numbers. So it's not just a matter of appropriating the money. We've got to do something. Yes, sir. It's up to Congress. <laughs> that's, that's an honest appraisal. Thank you very much. Mr. Lugomsky, thank you for acknowledging the obvious. We're dealing with real lives here, and we can write laws trying to condition conduct and we know in our own personal experience, newlyweds want to be in the same household. Families want to be close to one another. There's nothing wrong with those instincts. In fact, we reward them many places in the law. But in immigration law, we challenge them way too often. Thanks for your service. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm glad that Senator Cornyn has returned. Um, I have a bill called the Relief Act, which goes after the green card issue and aging out children. You have a bill which I have co-sponsored, America's Children Act. I want to accept the challenge that Senator Cornyn has made, and I want Senator Tellis being on this conversation because he and I have talked about this too. Let's put a bill before this committee. Let's see what elements we can agree on and put it before this committee. And let's test whether, full committee, let's test whether or not we can expand it in certain directions. I have members from your side of the aisle, Senator Tellis, coming up to me, not a great number, but some saying, well, I get to get a chance to vote on Dreamers in this year, and I haven't been able to say anything to them one way or the other. I want to say something to them. I want to give them that chance, but I think we have to test in the Judiciary Committee whether we can put together a bipartisan effort that can make it to the floor so we can implore McConnell and Schumer to give us our chance. Uh, there are just too many people like Ms. Raj Kumar whose lives are hanging in the balance, and I don't want to be uh, guilty of not trying. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would want to join with you because you've been an amazing leader on immigration in the short time that you've been with us. Uh, but let's do that. Let's, let's decide what is acceptable and then test whether other things can be added to it and bring something to the floor. Let's not go another 32 years without a bill. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair Durbin, I appreciate you saying that, too. I think that's the best way for us to get the work done. You know, a few years ago, we had two bills on the floor that came very 
very close. We had a historic number of Republicans voting for a path to citizenship for the DACA population. We almost got where we needed to be on addressing some of the border security issues. Now we can, um, I think, dust that off and come up with something productive. You know, I, for one, would like for this to be the Congress where we address the, the DACA population, that we also address some of these uh, guest worker programs and, uh, and uh, green card issues, which, to me, I live firsthand. I got exposed to the H-1B, v, uh, H-1B process in my job as a partner at Price Waterhouse. And I've tried to tell anyone who thinks that uh, we just need to find more computer scientists, more data analysts, more people with advanced degrees from the US population that they need to wake up and recognize if we want our economy to continue to grow, if we want to continue to, uh, to build on this great economy, that we've got to look to legal immigration as a critical part of fulfilling our workforce needs and, and really, uh, growing our innovation economy. Um, Mr. Melmet, uh, you were chief counsel at uh, CIS, right? Yes, sir. Um, it seems to me that they're working on technology that existed largely before MySpace existed. Um, if I mean, just based on your business perspective of that operation, the lack of electronic systems, it just seems like there's not going to be enough oil in the gears of CIS to even just process the current backlog. And for people like me who would like to see more going through, um, that they're going to have to really modernize and we're going to have to make the investments to allow them to do that. Do you agree? Absolutely, Senator. And I know my colleague. Professor Legomsky also um, supported the agency as they were wrestling with this after me. Um, being on the outside now, uh, it's pretty phenomenal the way technology is transforming business. Uh, there are some positive signs out of the immigration agency. Um, this year, the, they, they've now been running the H-1B registration mm -hmm. system as an online tool for a couple years, and that's gone well and successfully. Um, they're starting to do more online payments, but that gives you an idea of how far they are behind the private sector wow, in terms online of case payments. management. It's still a paper-based <laughs> process uh, and very slow. Yeah, um, and you know, I also agree, uh, Professor, that uh, when you build, and I've, you know, I've, I've got lifelong friends that back in the, in the 1990s brought on as H-1B visa workers, and I saw firsthand that connection to family members as they these were some younger, freshly out of graduate school or with a PhD, uh, building a life and building a family, getting caught up in all the things that uh, we're talking about here. That's why we do have to look at it because it's actually a drain and a distraction on the professionals. Um, it actually undermines productivity and their quality of life. And I think that we do have to look at it uh, through that lens. Mr. Melman, are, are you familiar with the Preserving Employment Visas Act that we proposed? Uh, familiar with it, yes, Senator. Uh, I mean, does it make sense conceptually that if we have all these unused visas, we have seven million, eight million plus job openings, that that's at least going to take a portion out of that pressure that we have today? It does, Senator. Uh, and I also think that uh, I've heard uh, in several hearings now that uh, we're tracking a lot more entrepreneurs, a lot more new businesses have opened up. I think the COVID pandemic has made people either pursue dreams that they had on the shelf or just pursue other ways. Uh, to make an income, uh, and they may never be going back to those jobs. So aren't we really undermining our ability to grow the economy and get back to a, a post-COVID kind of performance if we don't look at these issues? Uh, we are, and, and I would note that immigrants are uh, saw the statistic 25% more likely to start new businesses. Mm -hmm. And so hundreds of thousands of high-skilled professional workers can't leave their employer today, mm -hmm. otherwise they jeopardize their green card application. So both shortening that time period and, and allowing them to get their green card and then go out and start on their own or creating other opportunities are all going to boost the economy. And that, I, you know, I think just back on DACA, why I was so glad to hear uh, what Senator Durbin has proposed is we did a lot of research on people who would be qualified through the DACA program. And if you were to take a cohort of, depending upon the estimates, of 1.8 million to 2.2 million that would be eligible for the program, about 700,000 had enrolled in it. Um, they're extraordinary people. Uh, they tend to have higher levels of, they're either engaged in education, gainfully employed, serving in the military. I mean, for anyone who would have a uh, 
philosophical problem with a path to citizenship for that population should probably do their homework because I actually think it's a group of people that we should figure out a way to solve that problem. But I do also believe, Mr. Chairman, uh, the only way we're going to solve it is to have a broader discussion about some of these other things that I believe uh, that we could ultimately put a package together and make significant progress. And I hope that that progress is made in this Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tillis. I uh, just want to uh, compliment you on your effort as well on the Preserving Employment Visas Act, which would represent a, a great step forward in reducing the employment-based backlog. And uh, after today, I would love to work with you to see if we can incorporate some of the uh, uh, relief to the family-based backlog that we're talking about as well. Uh, next is Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your a great leadership here and all the senators. Uh, we have an, an all-star cast of people that have worked on this issue, including the chair, Senator Tillis, and uh, Senator Durbin, um, Hirono, and Blumenthal. Uh, I have cared a lot about this for a long time. I've cared a lot about it because my state um, is the home of so many refugees and immigrants. We have the biggest uh, population of Somalis, uh, the biggest population of Liberians, second biggest among and we also have workforce issues right now. So it is both where my heart is, but also uh, where my head is when it comes to our um, economy uh, throughout our state. Our unemployment rate is very, very low in Minnesota, way below the national average. And we have traditionally, because of bringing in immigrants, uh, have been able to uh, maintain one of the strongest economies um, in the country. Uh, which includes uh, one of the highest per capita of Fortune 500 companies. So I'll start with you, Mr. Melman. In your opening statement, you discussed how the U.S. is falling behind. Uh, I think about this all the time. Uh, when we have job openings, we can't fill them with various skill levels uh, of employees. I literally go into companies and I think about it because we talk about apprenticeships and workforce, and then I always say, and what's the most immediate thing we can do to shake this up? It's immigration reform, it's visas, it is all different things to create pathways to citizenship. What do you think, what policies do you think have the most detrimental effect right now on the ability of American companies to attract and retain top talent? Well, Senator, I would start with um, one, maximizing the, the immigrants who are already here. And so what we hear from our clients and companies is that they have employees who are caught in the green card backlog mm -hmm. and that um, limits their progress. It limits the roles that they can take on. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, it limits their ability to go out and create new enterprises. And so the green card backlog and per country issues, yep. okay. per, those are already here. Mm -hmm. um, I'd start with that. The other issue you hear about, uh, I suspect, is from companies who look to hire out of U.S. universities. Mm -hmm. And such a high percentage of graduates, particularly in STEM fields, are in computer-related occupations. If a company today asks me right now that they have a top candidate out of a U.S. university that they want to hire and sponsor for a work visa, the, ease, the earliest that individual could start would be not this October, but the following October. Exactly. And so, and I found it's even for some of our smaller companies, it's harder to get in line to get these employees. Because um, they may not have quite the structure to pursue the whole thing. So, mm -hmm. very yeah. good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to a bill I'm working on right now um, for our Afghan refugees. We're taking in a number of them in Minnesota, and uh, this bill would provide a pathway to permanent legal status for Afghan refugees uh, who were evacuated. Um, I guess I'd ask you, uh, Professor Legomsky. Um, what should we be doing for these refugees and for others um, in order to, um, who are facing long waits and processing times, and why is it important to change that? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think your solution is exactly the right one. Uh, we should be providing a path to lawful permanent resident status. Um, I think that the situation of all refugees is compelling, but in the case of the Afghan refugees, there are more reasons still. The big one and the obvious one is that these are folks who, at great risk to their own lives, have assisted American civilians and American military personnel in Afghanistan. Uh, with all the trauma they have already been through, uh, we don't need to superimpose the additional trauma of not knowing whether at any moment they will suddenly be picked up 
uh, and returned home. Uh, for their children, the situation is probably even more dire because they have less understanding of what is going on. And for their older children, uh, the awareness is even greater. So uh, a path to permanent resident status, I think, is the best thing we can do at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, Mr. Melmed, one other thing I wanted to note, and thank you for that answer, um, foreign um, tr doctors who are from other countries, but they are doing their medical, getting their medical degrees in the U.S. and do their residencies. Crazy situation where they have to go back to their home country. We'd love them to stay. Um, this is the Conrad 30 bill. We now, I now have 20 um, other um, co-sponsors, bipartisan. It's a bill that I have with Collins, Rosen, and Ernst uh, to try to continue that program and make it even stronger. It's called the Conrad 30 because it was named after Kent Conrad because North Dakota had so many problems in retaining its Senator Cornyn, another all-star cast member of people who want to get immigration reform done, um, knows. Um, and so that would be very important. Um, do you also think that uh, we need to make the case? I always, this is one of my big things, trying to make the case. I think businesses know it, but sometimes I think our citizens need to understand that connection with businesses. And uh, Senator Cornyn, uh, Coons, and Murkowski and I did a bill to require the Department of Labor to study the barriers that immigrants with advanced training face in finding employment um, when you look at our needs right now. Um, do you want to just comment briefly on that? And then I've got to let my other colleagues uh, take a shot here. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't comment on foreign physicians, as I'm a child of an immigrant foreign physician who settled in Dallas, Texas. Um, and I think Historically, the United States has been effective at identifying ways where there's win-win opportunities. Um, and so bringing foreign physicians to serve medically underserved areas uh, is, has been done in the past, and it's, a, it's an important tool at our disposal. And Congress should, should definitely continue to, to utilize that program. And I'll ask you a question on the record, Ms. Rajma. Thank you. And we'll get you one in writing so others can go. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Blumenthal. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, I join in thanking you and uh, the ranking member for your work, and especially on this issue of enabling more of our communities and our businesses to make use of foreign talent. And uh, it is one of the really great strengths of our nation that we are a nation of immigrants uh, from all over the world, including uh, Ukraine and Afghanistan, possibly the two greatest recent sources. I've been working very, very energetically to enable more of our Afghan at-risk allies to leave that country. There has been only a trickle after the initial surge of uh, those who were able to depart the country in the initial days of the withdrawal. And I am frustrated by the slow pace at this point, the continued lack of enabling of those uh, individuals to leave the country. They are a source of potential talent to us because they are the translators, interpreters, guides, workers. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Professor Legomsky, whether there's any precedent in recent history for enabling that kind of population to go from a temporary protected or parole status as they are now with the sort of Damocles over their heads very shortly, actually, having to leave the country to deal with that kind of major part of the population in those numbers? I can't think of a specific example in which Congress has uh, adjusted a large group of people from TPS status directly to either refugee or lawful permanent resident status. Um, there certainly, however, have been many executive actions in which former presidents have allowed particular groups of uh, those who face compelling humanitarian needs to be paroled into the United States. Um, the one thing I will say about TPS is that sometimes the objection you hear 
to making their status permanent is that TPS was meant to be only a temporary program. I, I take that objection seriously, but my own view is that whatever the original purpose of the admission of a particular group, circumstances change, and sometimes for humanitarian or even for interest, reasons of national self-interest, it makes sense to adjust that population. And I'd be hard-pressed to think of a group more deserving of that kind of treatment than the Afghan refugees who have been so helpful to us. As you say, they put their lives on the line for us, our troops and our diplomats, in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and they did it because they love this country, because they value freedom and democracy, and they were willing to put themselves and their families at risk to serve us. And we have a moral obligation here that transcends any self-interest, I think. Uh, you mentioned executive actions by presidents, former presidents. Uh, can you give me a couple? Um, I was afraid you were going to ask me that because my memory is starting to you slip. You can get back to me. <laughs> okay, I will. Thank you. Okay. Um, in, in my uh, home state of Connecticut, uh, my office has seen the kind of backlog that's been described by many of your colleagues. You're familiar with it in immigration processing times for pending applications. Uh, my, my own caseworkers have seen I-765 employment app authorization application waiting for months, literally months on end. And that's the reason that I advocated for an additional $200 million in funding for USCIS as part of um, an effort to address the backlogs. And you may have answered this in part already, but could you give me a specific to-do list with that money for USCIS? Yes. Um, I'm a little bit limited in what I can say because it has been eight years since I served as chief counsel, and I have to assume that at least some procedures have changed. Um, I will say that in all honesty, during my time there, um, it's not as if I noticed lots of obvious inefficiencies in the way applications were being processed. Um, my own view is that it's a positive thing that Congress, I believe for the first time for this fiscal year, has supplemented USCIS revenues with appropriations of its own. Normally, it's reliant, USCIS is reliant solely on the fees provided by the applicants themselves. In addition to that, nobody can be against constantly being on the lookout for ways to enhance efficiency. But to put this question in perspective, I think that both increasing efficiency and supplementing funds, both of which I count as positive steps, um, alone would produce just a small drop in the bucket. The big problem, and Senator Durbin has alluded to this, is Congress has to act by dramatically raising the caps for people. That's where the big gains are likely to be made. And until that happens, I think efficiency gains will give us only marginal improvement. Would you agree, Mr. Mellon? I, I do agree with Professor Legomsky. Um, I think until there, there are some efficiencies through digitization that Senator Tillis mentioned, and those would be measured in percentages, not major levers to reduce. I, I think the issues that we've talked about in terms of green card backlog, um, I just, if I could highlight, you know, the employment authorization document delay that your constituent ser services teams are wrestling with day in and day out. Um, that's a backlog that's just going to continue to increase. And as I mentioned, you can't hire your way out of that. You've got to somehow reduce the number of pending applications. Um, this administration has, to their credit, lengthened the validity of those documents, and that's helped a little bit, but obviously not enough. And so some of those bigger levers need to be pulled to bring that, that processing time down. It doesn't speed it. It just lets more people wait in line for longer periods. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Senator Durbin acknowledged the presence of uh, Ms. Raja Kumar's mother. And I want to extend to you a very uh, special aloha. I represent the state of Hawaii. And I, too, have had a very courageous mother who brought th three children to this country uh, to create a better life for us. And I am the only immigrant serving in the United States Senate right now. So a special aloha to you. Now, 
there is a consensus for among Democrats and re Republicans that we have a broken immigration system. So when you look at the over 11 million undocumented people who are here, we have over 800,000 dreamers who are actually signed up with many, many more who could qualify. You have the undocumented dreamers, maybe 250,000 of them. You have all the people stuck waiting for their visas and practically in the well, hundreds of thousands. So there is agreement that uh, our system is broken. Now, if you start with the proposition that we're going to need to uh, do uh, some sort of solution, come up with some sort of solution to the border situation, and that is how you're going to start immigration reform, then we're not going to get very far. That's one of the major reasons that we have not gone, uh, gone very far since 2013, when we actually managed to pass a bipartisan immigration bill that I thought was very comprehensive. It wasn't all that it could have been, of course, but immigration is screwed up in so many different areas that you hardly know where to begin. So as I'm sitting here listening to the, the testimony, uh, Dr. Uh, Legomsky and Mr. Milnad, I mean, you both have been working on immigration issues for a long time. And uh, Ms. Uh, Raja, Raja Kumar has lived it. If we were to put the two of you in a room and, and told you guys to come up with uh, areas of agreement for what we can do with our broken immigration system, do you think you could do that? Do you think you could come up with something that we could work on? I feel like that might be, the, if you that might be the toughest how do you question that you've sent our, our way. Um, I mean, I, honestly, I think Professor and I would disagree on a number of things. You know, I think well. we would we would both be well intentioned, and I think we would be committed to roll up our shirt sleeves and and get something done. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's an area where I think we would agree. It's these are hard issues to wrestle with, and everyone on either side is going to have to make compromises. Yeah, I, I very much agree. I, I found uh, Mr. Melmad to be an extremely reasonable person. Mm -hmm. um, especially given his comment that I would be an easy person to deal with. <laughs> um, but, and it's true that there are many, many areas in which I think we would easily find agreement, some in which we might find agreement with a little bit of fine tuning, other areas in which I'm sure we would disagree. The real question is whether we could come up with a plan that we both agree on and that would pass both houses of Congress. I think that would be a, a tougher issue because I know there's a wider diversity of opinion within the Senate and well, the within the House. If you were to leave uh, Congress out of it, and, uh, we, and we asked you to come up with something that's reasonable that addresses the huge backlog we have and you know all of the myriad problems that you have testified to, I would think that you would be able to come up with some reasonable areas uh, that, that would uh, enable us to go forward. But uh, every time the word immigration comes up, you know there are members uh, Mainly, I would say, of the Republican Party, because I feel like I can say that since uh, my friend there, Senator Corman, ha ha Cornyn has uh, uh, castigated the Democrats. But really, there were a lot of Republicans run for the hills. But at the same time, I know that our ranking member really wants to get something done in this area. And I, uh, after hearing this and talking with my colleague to my left, the, the chairman of the committee, I feel as though maybe we can get something done. Um, in the area of, of who should you know, have some sort of preference to come into our country, uh, Mr. Melnad, you said that we should enable people with, uh, with certain skill sets, uh, probably in the math and science areas. We certainly need workers in those areas. But I would just like to mention uh, to, uh, to you and this body, when we worked on the comprehensive immigration reform, there was a preference, I would say, for people with those kinds of uh, backgrounds and experiences to have preference to come into our country um, with visas. Now, we have a huge need for domestic workers, for healthcare workers, et cetera. These are not uh, people with science and uh, technology backgrounds, and yet, uh, with the kind of preference that was in the original uh, Comprehensive Immigration Bill, a lot of women would have been left out of our immigration system. They would have been left out of, a, in, of getting visas on their own. They would have had to marry usually the guy who had the STEM backgrounds and experiences. So I'd just like to note that uh, because we have huge needs for all kinds of workers in this country. And I, I would not want us to get to, to just focus on the people with the so-called advanced degrees and, and those kinds of experiences. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding this, this hearing. My hope is that we can come up with something. And in fact, you know, I'd welcome the two of you to, to uh, suggest something to us um, based on the testimony that you provided today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Uh, we had a few minutes ago, Senator Booker online to participate. Are you still there, Senator Booker? If you are, you're next for asking questions, and if not, then we will proceed with the second round of questions for members uh, who are with us. Uh, I want to come back to uh, Ms. Raja Kumar, who, uh, again, embodies the issue, one of the many challenges of our immigration system before us. I asked you previously what it would mean if the America's uh, Children Act were to pass, but I want to go uh, retrospective a little bit. Um, how would your life have been different over the last few years if you have had been able to get a green card uh, already? And as you answer that, you can share with us also what would, can you describe what would happen uh, in your life and with your family if you had to leave the United States? Thank you for your question. Um, I think that permanent residency would have uh, benefited me in many ways at several points in my life, but specifically over the past few years, especially once I turned 18, it would have given me the independence that I so badly desired. For example, I really wanted to be able to work when I was in college. Um, the out-of-state tuition, as I mentioned in my testimony, children like me don't qualify any for any university or federal financial aid. So the $70,000 of out-of-state tuition that my mom took upon herself was an exorbitant burden on my family. She jeopardized our only home. And, um, and my inability to support myself due to my inability to work was just an extra stress on the family, um, not even being able to take care of my personal expenses. And then in addition, in 2019, if I had my permanent residency, I would have loved to have been able to take an off a semester or even a year off school after my brother's passing and really mourn and process and heal and be there for my mother and had the confidence that I could have picked up my education once again when I felt ready without any impact on my future. If I had to leave first and foremost, after being separated from my mother, it means returning to a country that I've only ever been to twice before, um, a place where I have no place to live, no means of transportation, let alone a license, a career, or a support system, because apart from my mother, even my most immediate extended family reside in the US. So it would quite literally mean starting over completely from scratch um, and my only other option of staying here would be to apply for an H-1B application, which would only further my work visa sponsorship and make me give me a couple more years, but at the end of which I will once again face self-deportation. And the problem again with like these applications is they're fully luck-based, they're pure lottery, does not take into the account that I have the years that I have spent growing up here. And even if I were to be lucky enough to get an H-1B application and then be sponsored for my green card through my employer as my mom did, over a decade ago, I would once again fall towards the back of the line that she was in and the line that I aged out of. So neither option is very viable in my opinion. And very real circumstances. Uh, I want to focus back on the employment-based immigration system for another moment. The number discussed as the numerical limit for employment-based green cards is 140,000. We've referenced that figure earlier in the hearing. But that number does not actually represent the number of people who petitioned for an employment-based green card. Spouses and children of immigrants who accompany an employment-based immigrant uh, actually count against the 140,000 cap. I mentioned that in my opening statement. So therefore, less than half of the 140,000 employment green cards actually go to immigrants selected for employment reasons. A question for both Mr. Legomsky and Mr. Melbourne. Can you discuss how exempting spouses and children from the cap would improve our immigration system? Um, it would have the same kind of beneficial effect with slightly different numbers as some of the other bases for increasing the total cap, such as increasing the base number, um, recapturing unused visas, uh, eliminating the deduction for immediate relatives, and so on. I see um, a proposal to 
exempt the dependents from the cap as being in that same vein. And I think they would all have the same benefits. They would greatly shorten the waiting times for people who, after all, are going to be admitted at some point anyway. It's just that this would allow them to be admitted sooner rather than later, thereby helping the employers who need their essential labor right now, rather than forcing them to wait in the future. Mr. Moment. I, I agree with Professor Legomsky. I don't have anything that else to add other than you can see the snowball effect that when you have a 10 year backlog for a green card, people will marry, they will have children. Those folks are then being added to the line. So a um, little bit of an explanation of why that backlog is increasing even while doing nothing, um, just by nature of families growing. Well, I think it speaks both to the, the backlog and trying to address the backlog and at the same time, the purpose for which this was intended to impact employment and the economy. And when a majority of the numbers uh, are not the uh, sponsored entity, uh, but spouses and, and children of, that's limiting the employment and economic contribution side. So it makes sense to me. Senator Corn. Mr. Melmet, I mentioned uh, Senator Tillis's bill, Preserving Employment Visas Act, which would recapture 92,000 employment-based green cards that went unused. Um, I suppose the answer to this question is obvious, but if we recaptured 92,000 employment-based visas, that would uh, reduce the uh, backlog accordingly, correct? It certainly would, Senator. And talk about the impact that that would have, what beneficial impact it would have on uh, on children who are in Ms. Raja Kumar's situation, uh, if we're able to recapture those uh, green cards. Would it help those who might otherwise age out of the system? Yeah, yes, Senator. You would, you would shorten note the wait time for a green card and um, wouldn't, of course, protect everyone from aging out, but you would certainly reduce the likelihood and chances of children turning 21 before the parents get a green card. Okay. And to Senator Durbin's point, less people think that we all disagree on about everything. Uh, I mentioned the bill that he and I partnered on, Healthcare Workforce Resilience Act. This would capture 40,000 employment-based immigrant visas for doctors and nurses. If there's one thing I hear from my hospitals in Texas, it's the shortage of nurses um, because of the burnout factor associated with COVID-19 and the like. And now uh, uh, hospitals are having to pay incredible multiples of what they ordinarily would pay to nurses um, to contract with companies that uh, basically will provide the nurses at, at a given price. but. Mr. Melman, you stated that more than 2.6 million migrants are currently employed as healthcare workers. And as I mentioned, about 30% of the physicians in Dallas and Fort Worth are foreign born. What impact would this have if we're able to recapture those 40,000 employment based visas for doctors and nurses? What, what impact would that have on, on the public's access to healthcare? Well, th thank you for highlighting that fact. It is an industry that's, as they say, overrepresented with immigrants, and they're critical to, to that industry. The, addressing the green card backlog would do two things for them. Some of them are already here, and as we've talked about at length, are caught in that backlog and therefore unable to change uh, roles, progress in their roles, um, start new enterprises. Uh, but there's also others in the healthcare industry who come straight to the United States on a green card. And so by making additional visa numbers available, you would actually increase the, avail the number of workers in immediately, and that would have a near-term impact. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, just as a follow-on to that, Mr. Melman, I want to recognize from uh, your written testimony submitted that um, a recent report by the Niskanen Center indicates that if the federal government recaptured 231,000 unused employment-based green cards, the policy would add $216 billion to GDP over 10 years. And if it recaptures 940,000 unused employment-based and family preference green cards, the policy would add $815 billion to GDP over 10 years. So further... Uh, makes the point. Senator Durbin. 
Let me just add a couple things very quickly and uh, thank the panel for their patience. Uh, the Tillis bill, Senator Cornyn uh, cleared the hotline on the Democratic side, but there were two on your side who objected. They're both members of this committee. At least one of them has said he doesn't want one more immigrant in this country, and that's the problem. We're, if we're going to do anything, we have to do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to need 60 votes. We're going to have to find something to come out of this committee in a bipartisan fashion that has a chance of 60 votes on the floor. That may limit our scope, but I hope it doesn't. But I'm willing to undertake that. I think what we've heard today ought to be a compelling reason to start that conversation and See if we can. Well, I would. Ju I would just say to my my friend, the chairman. Obviously, um, we pass things around here by unanimous consent. But when we can't get a hundred senators to agree, then we vote them out of committee, and we get them on the floor and get sixty votes for cloture, and we pass them. And uh, it may be necessary because um, this. Immigration can be an emotional issue. Frankly, some of the positions taken on either side of the aisle, I don't find make a lot of sense to me. But I do think there's a core, certainly, of 60-plus senators who are willing to take up common sense measures like this and to uh, pass them if we can get a commitment to mark them up in committee and then to, on the floor. And I just want to say publicly how much I appreciate your willingness to... Uh, um, take up and mark up a, a, an immigration bill, particularly relating to a situation like Ms. Raja Kumar finds herself in, such as proposed by, by the chairman of the subcommittee. I think this is something we ought to be able to find a solution to and maybe some of these other areas um, as well. Mr. Chairman, I want to uh, acknowledge to you and to salute the panel. You may have seen history in the making, who knows? Uh, I always say the education of a senator is a daunting task and a public declaration by a senator that they're actually going to try to legislate is almost historic around here. So uh, who knows? This may end well. And I, I want to thank all three of you, and particularly Ms. Raja Kumar. Your story is so compelling. It really calls on all of us to get up and do something. So I hope we can. Thank you for being here today, all of you. Thank you, Senator Turpin. Before uh, moving to uh, close this hearing, I'm going to take the uh, uh, chair's privilege and ask just one more question. Uh, that I think is important to uh, raise today. Uh, and it's going to be for Professor Legomsky. You know, in 1996, Congress passed the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. With that measure, Congress attempted to create disincentives to come and remain unlawfully in the United States. An individual who remains unlawfully present in the United States for more than 180 days, but less than a year, is barred from admission for three years. Those that are unlawfully present for more than a year are barred for 10 years. In the most extreme case, if one re-enters after having been removed, after being unlawfully present for more than a year, they are permanently barred. Exceptions to these bars remain very limited. Professor, in your testimony, you advocated the repeal of the three-year tenure, and permanent bars. You said they create a procedural catch-22, whereby someone who otherwise qualifies for legal permanent resident status has no place to apply for it. Can you uh, elaborate on that for a minute? Yes, and I apologize in advance that this explanation will be a little bit on the nerdy side, but I don't think I can avoid it. Um, when, when a person has been unlawfully, if a person is currently unlawfully present, then that, of course, alone is already a ground for removal. As you've indicated, these 310 bars apply to people who have been unlawfully present at some point in the past. My own view is that they are inherently disproportionate uh, to the nature of the offense, even in general, given the desperation that drives people to enter or to remain in the U.S. without status. But the particular procedural catch-22 that you referenced uh, is as follows. Um, suppose you are a person who meets all of the substantive eligibility requirements that Congress has set for becoming an LPR. That is, you fall within one of the family categories, uh, you do not fall within any of the inadmissibility grounds, and you've waited your turn in line, and now your priority date has become current, you're at the front of the line ready to be admitted. Um, but there is a point in your life at which you have been unlawfully present. 
you can't simply go to the U.S. consulate and get a visa, uh, which is the traditional route for becoming an LPR, because the moment you step outside the country, you will now have departed, and the unlawful presence plus the departure together make you inadmissible for, in almost all cases, 10 years. Uh, the visa will be denied on that ground alone. That would be okay if you could instead simply do the paperwork here in the United States through the process known as adjustment of status. But with rare exceptions, you can't do that. I shouldn't say rare. With uh, an exception of only a minority, you can't do that either. For one thing, you are statutorily ineligible for adjustment uh, if you have not been admitted or paroled. So if you entered the country without inspection, that alone would rule you out. Um, even if you entered the country legally on a non-immigrant visa but then overstayed and became unlawfully present in that way, okay, you can overcome the admitted or paroled bar, but then you run into another obstacle. Because to be eligible for adjustment, you also have to show that you have been continuously lawfully present, pardon me, you have maintained continuous lawful status in the United States since your entry, which you would not have done had you overstayed. Um, to be fair, I should acknowledge an important exception, and that is that immediate relatives are exempt from the requirement of lawful continuous status. Um, but unless you are an immediate relative who became undocumented only by reason of having overstayed, as opposed to entering without inspection, then you're not within any of the exceptions. And despite having met all of the substantive eligibility for re requirements for admission, you can't apply for it outside the country and you can't apply for it inside the country. That's why I describe it as a procedural catch-22. Thank you very much. Uh, enlightening for those who are unfamiliar with that dynamic and uh, not very for the many, many who have personally or know someone who is caught in that catch-22. Um, and uh, now before we conclude, I wanna move to enter a number of statements into the record including statements from Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Americas for Prosperity and the Libra Initiative, America Families United, the Center for Migration Studies of New York, CHIRLA, Forward.US, Improve the Dream, NACS, National Immigration Law Center, and the National Venture Capital Association. Without objection, those statements will be included, and the record for the hearing will close one week from today. Now, as this hearing concludes, I do want to thank my fellow subcommittee members and especially our witnesses for joining us. I'm glad to see that uh, we might have uh, taken some steps forward uh, and made progress today. That's why we held this hearing, to try to find pathways for progress and to improve this outdated and overly complex immigration system. I look forward to uh, working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to move the America's Children Act and other important legislation forward in Judiciary Committee. And to just sort of capture the spirit of the last couple of hours, we've heard overwhelming evidence that our immigration system is broken. Outdated visa limits are hurting our economy and endangering workers. Enormous backlogs are separating families, sometimes for years, sometimes for decades. Arbitrary cutoffs are forcing children who grew up in this country to leave their families and their only home. So we have a responsibility to fix all of this. Just think about all the lives and stories reflected in the chart here behind me. If you're a U.S. citizen with a sister in Mexico, you're supposed to wait 224 years before she receives her visa. That's the impact of the current backlogs. If your married child is in the Philippines, he and his partner face a wait time of 155 years. If you're an employer trying to hire a Chinese worker with two years of training, your employee should expect to wait 44 years before receiving a green card. Indian workers with a bachelor's degree are expected to wait a staggering 90 years. These aren't wait times. They are de facto bans. And it's past time to make our immigration laws reflect reality as well as the current needs of our nation. And when we do so, that reform will benefit everyone. 
By reuniting immigrant families, we can help communities thrive. By inviting immigrants to join our workforce, we can grow our economy for all. By welcoming immigrants from countries with lower levels of immigration through our diversity visa program, we contribute to the rich cultural fabric of the United States. By recapturing unused visas, we can reduce employment and family-based immigration backlogs and add billions of dollars to our GDP, reunite families, and strengthen our economy at the same time. By making sure any bill coming out of the America Competes You Seek a Conference includes immigration provisions, we can help build our domestic STEM workforce and encourage startup companies to establish roots here. These reforms are especially important at a moment when our workforce is aging and demand for visas is higher than ever. America has a proud history of welcoming immigrants. And now is the moment to recommit ourselves to that task. As Mr. Melman said in his testimony, by doing nothing, the United States is going backwards. And although it's not a topic of this hearing, I uh, want to conclude by taking a step back and acknowledging a few recent events. Right now, the people of Ukraine are enduring a brutal and unprovoked assault by Russian forces. More than two and a half million people have already been forced to flee their homes, and that number seems to be growing by the day, creating the largest European refugee crisis since World War II. America must be a leader, by example, and protect Ukrainians who have been driven away from their homes, just as we should be doing for the Afghan evacuees who made it to our soil, as well as Afghan refugees abroad. At the same time, I urge the Biden administration and my colleagues to remember the refugees who are waiting at our border, kept out by the cruel and unnecessary Title 42 policy. The administration made the correct decision to end Title 42 for unaccompanied children, recognizing that there is no public health need to deny the rights of lawful asylum seekers. It's past time to end this draconian policy for all the individuals and families who come here to escape terrible persecution. So colleagues, again, I ask that we recommit ourselves to reflecting our values as a nation of immigrants. Thank you all for your participation again here today. And with that, today's hearing is adjourned.